Malachi chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Verse 8. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. And now... And treat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 12. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what's been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Verse 14, Cursed be the cheat who has a mill in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And then look at chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Verse 3, Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So you shall know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was found in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. Verse 7, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Verse 8. But you have turned aside from the way. You've caused many to stumble by your instruction. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Let's pray. You, O Lord, are a great king, and your name is to be feared among your people and among all nations. You are, as we've just sang together, holy, holy, holy. We come in great need that the God that made us, you, O God, would speak to us into our very hearts, not just our ears, but into our hearts. That we might see that you truly are set apart. And that you truly are the one true God. And that we would truly be true worshipers. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So as Thanksgiving is coming up this week. Perhaps your father's coming over for Thanksgiving, or your boss 
Uh, maybe your boss is not coming over for Thanksgiving, but just imagine if you were inviting your boss over for Thanksgiving. Uh, maybe the last person you want to invite over in some cases, or, or your father, or maybe the governor. Perhaps that's not the best example of somebody you would want to invite over is Governor Pritzker for your Thanksgiving, for some of you. And suppose you invited him over, and when you served the meal, you decided to serve your father or your boss or someone you respected like a governor, that you decided to serve them leftovers. And you brought them out, and you served them leftovers, and you said, as they looked puzzled, you said, oh, we'll eat the turkey after you leave. But y'all can have this. We had it early in the week. Glad you're here. We think a lot of you. So here, have the leftovers. We'll eat the turkey after you leave. And the ejection by the father, who should be honored, and by this governor, who should be feared or respected, or this boss, the objection could be, you're giving me the leftovers and keeping the best for yourself. You don't seem to think very much of me. Some of you are doing that before the Lord. To God. You dishonor God's name when you offer Him your leftovers. Look at chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 again. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If then I'm a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name? But you say, have we despised your name? Have they done it? What's verse 7 say? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Verse 8, look at it again. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. We accept you, give you favor. The people of God's day, that he had done wonderful things for the Israelites, were dishonoring God's name by offering him second best. By giving him the leftovers and keeping the best for themselves. Now these leftovers, what's the Bible say about them in verse 8? We may say, well, what's the big deal? God doesn't need anything. So why must we give him our best of everything? And, of course, I hope you're not immediately thinking just of money because it's not talking just about money. In fact, it's talking about animals here and sacrificial offerings. There's a lot more involved here than that. God says about it in verse 8, if you don't think it's a big deal, God says it's what? What's your Bible say in verse 8? You looking at your Bible? Is this not evil? It says it two times in verse 8. Is this not evil? It's a big deal. These leftovers are evil, but you're coming back and asking favor from me. The word favor is used twice in the, te the text here well, as well in verse 9. And now, this is, what the, this is the people speaking here in verse 9. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. Here's your leftovers, God. Now, do this for us. Favor us. Let us be out of this economic condition that we're in for the people of Israel at the time. God says, am I going to give you favor when you're practicing evil, when you're giving me the leftovers, when you're giving me second best? Would you do that to a governor? Would you do that to your father? Would you do that to a master? But you're doing it to me. In fact, God says in verse 10, I wish somebody would just close the whole thing up. You see what verse 10 says? I wish somebody would just take a sign, as one pastor said, and put it on the, put it on the outside of the building of the temple, closed for business. We're closed. Because there's no point in bringing offerings to worship me if this is how you're going to go about it, is what God says. Look at verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire in my offer in vain, altar in vain. I have no pleasure 
in you. I know pleasure in this, going through the motions of worship. I wished one of you, one of you priests, because that's who he talks about in verse 6, would have a zeal for my name, a passion for my name, that you see what's going on, and you would say, enough of this. Enough of this evil. Instead of winking at it and accepting these offerings on behalf of the people. Look at chapter, look at verse 11 and 13. We can see why God considers this evil and why he says just, just shut the whole thing down. Don't even bother with offering me stuff that's second best, that's the leftovers. Because in doing so, you're not fulfilling the minimum requirement of worship to me. What you're doing is you're actually doing the opposite. You're despising me. You're despising my what? Name. Look what he says in verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. Over and over in verses 11, all the way through verse 14, even in the chapter 2, God's name is referenced even prior to those verses eight times in this passage of Scripture, if my memory serves correctly. God is concerned about the honor of his name because he wants it to be known that the God of Israel, Yahweh, is the one true and living God. He's not like the other gods of the nations who are no gods at all. And these are the people that have been called by his name, the Lord's people. And so he says in verse 12, but you profane his name, he says. You profane it when you say the Lord's table is polluted. When you say, verse 13, what a weariness this is. But he says, I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts, verse 14, and my name will be feared among the nations. So when I look back at verse 10 and the Lord says in verse 10, Oh, that there will be one among you who would shut the doors. A question comes to mind, Who will shut the doors of irreverent worship? And the answer should be here, the priest. Of all the people in Israel, the, the Levites, the tribe of the Levites who were the priest, they should be the ones zealous and passionate enough for the name of the Lord and His honor that they would do something about it. You would expect the priest would. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O priest, he says, this command, you looking at chapter 2, verse 1? Now, O priest, this command is for you. They should be the ones shutting the doors. But instead, there is silence and there are no actions. Now, brothers and sisters, the big question for us this morning is this. Is God's name honored this is the question for you to ask yourself. Is God's name being honored by what I'm giving Him? That encompasses, as we'll see before the end of the message, a whole lot more than what you may or may not be putting in the offering plate or giving online or whatever. This is not a message about that. There's another sermon in Malachi for that, and I believe it's in chapter 3 that we'll get to. Is God's name honored by what I'm giving him? I want you to think about that this morning. That's for every person here. Is God's name being honored by what I'm giving him? Or you could ask it this way. Am I giving God my best? Or am I giving God the leftovers? Look at chapter 2, verse 2. A key verse. Chapter 2, verse 2. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name. This is what God's concerned about. That's the main concern of the text. Give honor to the Lord's name. He says, if you won't take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. So there's the corrective here for the priest and for the people to follow who are engaging in Leftover worship, second-class offerings. The corrective here is to take what God says in this text, take it to heart. So as we ask ourselves this question this morning, as believers, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 15, at the Jerusalem conference, 
that God had called out among the Gentiles a people for his name. So that Israelites who are believers, true Israelites, not just by flesh but by faith in Jesus, and Gentiles who have faith in Jesus, they are the people who are called by his name. Oh, church, if we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus, we are the people, amen? We are the people called by the name of the Lord. We're Jesus' people. We belong to him. We bear his name. Our baptism reminds us of that as we follow him on believers' baptism. And so as we ask ourselves this question, is what I'm offering to the Lord my best? Or am I giving him leftovers right now? Am I actually despising the Lord by what I'm offering him? Is the way I'm giving actually showing that I don't really think much of him? What, what, is, what, what are you communicating about who God is in relation to what you offer him? What's it communicate about God? And the Lord says here, take, take it to heart what I'm saying. So I want to share with you, church family, here's two things to take to heart. And I'm just going to give you two words and then elaborate on them. Two, two motivations to take to heart. One of them, number one, is curse. The word curse. And secondly, the second word we'll speak about from the scripture here is the word covenant. These are two motivations. God speaks to the Levitical priest here, but also to the people, so that they won't give leftovers to God, but they will offer their best to consider the curse and consider the covenant. We were at a, my son's basketball game yesterday, and they were playing all kinds of a plethora of diversity of music between, in, uh, I said innings or quarters or timeouts getting on my nerves, but one of the time they played the Burger King song. You know the Burger King song? At BK, have it your... And then what did they say? You rule. Now, I confess to you this morning, for a long time, I thought it said you drool. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, Burger King, Whopper, I'm drooling here, right? You drool. But actually, it's an, uh, an appeal to the customer that, hey, you have it your way. It's, it's always been Burger King's slogan. And this is not me hating on Burger King, all right? My point is here is that that kind of mentality had crept into the people of God in Malachi's day. And that kind of approach has also infiltrated our own day. At FBC, have it your way. You rule. Now, that's not how we want to be as a church. That's not how you want to be at your, as a family, right? But it can subtly creep in that our offerings become giving what we feel is wise in our own eyes whether that be what's in the offering plate, whether that be how we serve in this capacity within the church or how we serve and honor the Lord's name as his offering outside the church. And we become the determiner that we rule, that we're king, and we'll decide what we think's best and therefore fall short of what God says. Why is there a curse and who is king? Look at chapter 1, verse 14. Cursed be the cheat who is male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. So first of all, the issue going on there is you got somebody that says, I vow, I'm committed, I'm going to make this vow and I'm going to commit this offering to the Lord. Then they change their mind. Kind of reminds you of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts who committed to sell some land and give it to the Lord. Then they, 
got set on the couch later, and one of them said to the other, honey, I think we can keep some of that back so we can get us that swimming pool, in-ground swimming pool we've been wanting. And they, they were lying to the Holy Ghost. They were lying to God, what we find out, and they both fell down dead because it was evil. Why is there a curse? Why and who? Because God's king. And that's the answer to my question. You see what the rest of verse 14 says? Cursed is to cheat. And then he says, look at the middle of the verse, verse 14. You look at the middle of the verse, you see the conjunction? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? You remember that, some of you from the 80s? You see the word for? For! Here's why. I am a great king. Meaning, he's the only king. Meaning, you're not king. Meaning, all the gods of the Egyptians from whom I delivered you, all the gods of the Canaanites in whom you settled, all the gods of the Babylonians from which I've taken you out of captivity and returned you to this land are no gods at all. That he is king. And he is king of kings and he is the only God. Says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared, not just among you, but what's the rest of verse 14 say? My name will be feared among the nations. And God's saying to his people who are called by his name, who bear his name, that I'm going to work in such a way through you that when people observe how I'm working, they're going to see that I'm the one true God, that I'm the great king. So do away with your Burger King, you rule mentality when it comes to how you're going to order what you're going to do in relation to worship. You don't make the orders. God does. And some things are ex extremely explicit in Scripture. And others we pray about and we go before the Lord and we ask the Lord, how should I serve in this way or what should I do in this situation? But our heart and desire through prayer and counsel and searching the Scripture is that God's name would be honored. God, what can I do most to honor your name? So I'll ask you this question. Who is ruling so we think about God, the great King, who is ruling right now? How you're living and worshiping and making decisions. Who rules in your life? Is it God and His Word? Or is it you? Someone said uh, to go ahead and Worship second best and do what's right in your own eyes and kind of be flippant about your worship before the Lord and your offering to the Lord. It's like writing an invitation to God. Writing an invitation to God and saying, Dear God, you are incordially invited to send your wrath upon me. Every time we engage in giving God leftovers or giving Him second best. It's like asking God, just go ahead and pour your wrath on me. That's what was happening here. They were inviting God's wrath, His curse. And I know we don't, in our culture, people are dismissive of the word curse nowadays. It's something in fantasy movies and books and or we think of curse words that are used. But I want you to understand something. The word curse is something we sang about this morning, how Christ has removed us from a curse. But that curse is something placed upon humanity ever since the Garden of Eden. And outside a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're under a curse. And though you may profess the Lord Jesus Christ, if you continually, unrepentantly, engage in offering second best to the Lord, it conveys that you're still under the curse. That you're like the people of Malachi's day where God said, I loved you. But we find out in Romans, not all of Israel is of Israel. That Paul prayed for some of the Israelites that he could be a curse for them. 
Because some of the Israelites themselves, sons of the sons of Jacob, we read in chapter 1, verse 2, that he loved and he saw he hated. Some of these people, they are under a curse. They're not true believers. And so one motivation this morning is there's a curse for those who will continually and unrepentantly engage in giving the Lord second best. God says about them, as one person said, God will see to it that they have feces on their faces. I know that sounds funny, but of course it's not. But if you look in verse 3 of chapter 2, that's exactly what he says. Look at verse 3 of chapter 2. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces. Where's that dung going to come from? The dung of your offerings. You're going to bring me a blind sheep. You're going to bring me a, a, a calf with a, a blemish on it or a, 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 limp, a leg that's limp and lame. Then I'm going to take the dung of that and desecrate you. What that meant was this. You're desecrating me by offering second best. So you priest, if you continually engage with this, I'm going to put curses upon you, inflict curses upon you, not just the original curse, but curse your blessings. And you will not be esteemed. You will be desecrated just as you're desecrating me. I will treat you like you're treating me. Is that the way you want to be treated? That's what you're asking God to do, priest, by continuing with this and not taking it to heart. And that's what you're asking God to do, friend, by continuing with this second best offering, by the, this religious playing along and not following Jesus with your whole heart. You're asking for the curse to remain upon you. And for God to treat you just like you're treating Him. That's how some of you are this morning. You're treating God in a way that does not honor Him by how you live your life. The God that made you. Continually. And others, probably most, Or trying not to be that way. Right? You don't want to dishonor God's name. But if you're like me, you find yourself, I go through a passage of scripture like this, and, and I'm, I'm seeing that I'm falling short so often. It's not in an unrepentant way, but often I am falling short. We are falling short. How much we need. That one once and for all offering that Jesus makes to atone for our sins. And can be thankful that he's done that and forgiven us. But take these motivations to heart. There's a curse. And secondly, there's a covenant. There's a covenant. My boys went with me to father and son camp here a few weeks ago. And while we were there, my oldest son Josiah, I forgot why you were saying it, son, when we were talking about something. And he said, you remember when we were kids, we were kids, you know, like, yeah, I still kind of consider you to be kids, but, you know, uh, we were little. I used to love how you would tell us stories. You would tell us stories. And it made me feel good that he remembered that. And sure enough, when the kids were little, and I don't know, for several years, I would go in at nighttime and Get all, sometimes get all four of them and get in the room. Sometimes we get a flashlight. They loved having a flashlight with the lights out. They'd say, turn the lights out, Dad, turn the lights out. And I'd tell them just these crazy stories, you know, that I just couldn't, just crazy, craziness right on the spot. And they just loved that, silly stories. And we'd laugh and all that. Beloved, don't you see what God is doing here? 
when you go back to chapter 1, he says to, to them, before he ever rebukes them for their second best offerings, in chapter 1, verse 2, what's he say? He says, I have loved you. He said, I, I loved you and I hated Esau. And just in those words in chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, what God's doing is he's, he's saying, you remember these stories? These stories of love that I've shown to you and I made this covenant with you? And your ancestors, they were in Egypt. And I told Moses what my name was, just as Brother Tim read from Exodus chapter 3, verse 9, uh, chapter 3, verse 15 this morning, that he is the Lord, that he is Yahweh. And how I called you by my name, and I said that I'll harden Pharaoh's heart, that I might proclaim the excellencies of my name through you. And Exodus chapter 9, verse 6. He's saying, Do you remember? I've loved you. Chapter 1, verse 2. I remember one time going to Lydia's room and just telling her a story by herself. This is when she was, this is not now, she's 15 now, okay, but we're talking eight or nine. Going to her room and we, we were making up this story. And it was a good one. And we decided. We were going to write a book, a children's book. And the title of this children's book would be The Skunk That Lost Its Stink. Isn't that a great title for a book? That was what our story was about that night, The Skunk That Lost Its Stink. Doesn't that intrigue you? Maybe I have to follow through on that. Another book I'd like to write for children that I thought about as I went through this text this week would have this title, You Are Little, But You Are Loved. Wouldn't that be a good title for a children's book? You are little, but you are loved. The reason I say that, as God tells them you are loved in chapter 1, verse 2, what do they say? They say, how have you loved us? What's happened? They went into exile. Now there's been a return to the promised land and a reconstruction, a rebuilding of the temple but it's not as great as it once was. It's not as big of a temple and fancy as a temple as it once was. And there's not many people there like there once was. Their economic conditions are not what they once were. They are little in the sight of the people. But what's God saying to them in chapter 1, verse 2? You are loved. You're not hated. You are little God is saying to them, before he ever gets on to them and rebukes them, you are little, but you are loved. And what's happening in Israel as they're bringing these offerings, when the exile took place and they were kicked out of Jerusalem where they're at right now on Malachi's day, and they weren't in Jerusalem at all, the temple was destroyed. And in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus it says the fire on the altar was to always be lit. So that offerings and worship was always being made to the one true God in Israel. But when that temple was destroyed, what happened to the fire? Well, the fire went out. But what's happening now? The temple's been rebuilt. The altar's been rebuilt. The fire has been relit. Offerings are being made. Not the right kind of offerings. But what God's doing here is He's continuing His covenant love for them. Despite their history of golden calves and doubting God's Word and hating Moses and judges cycling, all these things that are history in exile, God, these are still God's people. His covenant love continues. There's continuity of the covenant. And He still wants there to be this covenant worship so he says in chapter 2, verse 4, look at it. Chapter 2, verse 4. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. Look at verse 5. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. And he feared me, and he stood in awe. He stood in awe of my name. So he mentions this covenant with Levi. The covenant with Levi, the agreement with the sons of Levi, they were the priests. They would be the ones that took care of the temple. 
They would be the ones that accepted the offerings and offered up the offerings of the people before God. God was continuing His covenant with His people. The covenant with Levi was an extension of that. The motivation here for the people was to see it, back in chapter 1 verse 2 that yes, there's this curse that can motivate us to be sure that we're not offering second best and giving God the leftovers. Well, we also should be motivated by the fact that despite all of this, God continues with us. What a patient God. Aren't you glad God's not like you? How patient he's been with his children. But God can smell the sacrificial offerings that are being made in Israel at the time. He smells the sacrificial offerings coming from the temple, and their offerings stink. They're not a sweet-smelling savor. The people are little, and they don't feel loved. Because they're not thinking about God. They're thinking about all the circumstances that they're going through. And they're not remembering the stories about how God had delivered them and how God had been gracious to them. They don't see the required offerings that they're supposed to be giving as a reminder to them of God's continuing love for them and His great electing love for them. Esau, I hated, but Jacob I've loved. They've despised God's name by what they say and do. Look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 13. But you say, chapter 1, verse 13, what do they say in chapter 1, verse 13? Do they say, oh, how I love your law. That's what the psalmist said. Oh, how I love your law that we can, we can engage in these offerings and go by these laws so that we can have a relationship with God and be close to God. But what do they say in chapter 1, verse 13? They don't say, oh, how I love your law. They say, what a weariness this is. And they snort at it. They don't see God's covenant as a blessing. They see God's covenant as if it's a curse almost, as if it's a burden to them. Some of you are familiar with the news headlines this week. I've probably been in the headlines for a while. I don't keep up with everything about Lake and Riley. Is that, some of you know who this is. This young woman in her 20s, maybe 22 years old, a student, in, a college student in Georgia who, I don't know when it happened, um, but evidently maybe the court case was unfolding this week. But a young college student out for a run, a jog, um, I think in broad daylight. And the man saw her. And he raped her. And she got on her phone and she fought and she tried to call 911. And I don't have all the details down with all this, but uh, she called and later they could monitor her as they monitored her phone. You know how iPhones are set up nowadays, they monitor your heartbeat and they could see when she was running. And they looked back at the data and they could see how her heartbeat, how fast it was pumping as she was being attacked. So they could see how long the duration of this attack took place. And how she fought against him. And he took a rock and smashed her head. And they could see when her heartbeat stopped. They could tell the moment she, she died. And so as it's been in the headlines, of course, you think of an incident like this and you think, what an absolute example of pure what? Evil. And it is. And I think the guy, the guy that did it got a life sentence. My first gut reaction to that, that doesn't seem right. He shouldn't be breathing. That, that seems to be just. Based on what I know. We want justice on such evil don't we for 
friend, God says that our second best offerings and leftovers are evil. Do you want justice on that evil? Then you should remain under the curse. But we sang about it this morning. Christ became a curse for us. Christ bore in himself, Jesus Christ bore the curse that was due us upon a tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. We're told in Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus, he's a better sacrifice, he's a better priest. He's a better offering. In him is a better covenant. Hebrews 7 verse 26 says this, For indeed it was fitting that we should have such a great high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. As we think of the weightiness of this, of this curse that we should be under and may be under if in fact we're not a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we think of this new covenant that's been made and ratified by the blood of Jesus in which we no longer bring animal sacrifices because he's the once for all sacrifice. Amen? then we should be motivated then, if we believe these truths, not just in our head and in our heart, we should be motivated to give God our absolute best, motivated by God's unchanging covenant love in Christ Jesus. As Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8, that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Things present, yet things to come, height, depth, or any other creature, any other thing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, with what love in which God himself bears the curse, satisfies his own wrath, is treated, his son treated as if he's the one that offered the leftovers to his own father. So that his wrath could be satisfied against us. And we could be called his children. In light of this covenant, in light of our Christ, in light of this curse being born by him, what kind of offering should we be making to the Lord? So here's the application to flesh out before we go. What does God want from me? <laughs> what does God want from me? Such messages can sometimes feel overwhelming. My one word answer for that would be everything. I want your life. Chapter 2, verse 7 says this the lips of the priest should guard knowledge, and the people should seek instruction from his mouth. So just looking at chapter 2, verse 7, it says the priest should guard knowledge, the priest should give instruction, and the people should seek instruction. Jesus is our high priest. We don't have priests today. That's the reason we, you, we don't call the elders here, including myself, we don't say, hey, priest Steve. Don't do that. That'd be weird. I'm not a priest. Jesus is our high priest. We don't have priests. Priests are those who... Take offerings, animal sacrifices, and offer, him, offer them to the Lord. That's not what we do. But we do are charged with instruction. So there could be application here, of course, for elders to those that teach God's Word to give true instruction. Fathers, you're charged with giving true instruction to your children so we could extend that application to those who are charged with teaching to say, be sure that you're giving true instruction. Not impartial instruction. 
But the people are to seek instruction. Seek instruction, it says in chapter 2, verse 7, that would be with the intent to obey God's word, to obey that. So what does God want from me? If you're teaching, he wants true instruction. He wants you to lead the people you're leading, teach the people you're leading what true worship is and true offerings are and not close a blind eye to second best. For the people, we're reminded in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we're like living stones being built to be a holy priesthood. We are a priesthood of believers. Did you understand that? A priesthood of believers making spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. And later it says in that same passage, to proclaim the excellencies of Christ. So what he wants from us from 1 Peter as this kingdom of priests, which includes Jews and Gentiles. What he wants from us in this sense is he wants us to proclaim his excellencies, to offer spiritual sacrifices. That's what he wants from us. Hebrews chapter 13 says this, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. There what it means to offer God the best. Offer him the praise from your lips. Praise in the worship service. Praise in the workplace. Praise about who God is from your lips. Praise before your family. But also it says, do, do not neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Loving God and loving others are offerings being made to the Lord. It encompasses a lot. It encompasses everything. Loving God and loving others encompasses everything we do. And Romans chapter 12, verse 1 makes it clear that we'll get to in a few weeks when we get back to the book of Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... By the mercies of God, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So what this simply means is, what does God expect from us? He expects that how we live our life, we will be seeking to love Him and love our neighbors as ourselves in every way. There's no sphere of our life that should not be connected to be an offering to the Lord. Nothing. It all should be. And that may feel overwhelming. Thank God for Jesus. He's faithful to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess. We confess how we fell and how we offer ourselves. I'm thankful to be part of a church family where sometimes I observe or hear about brothers and sisters that I go to church with that are part of our church family who the way you're living, the way you're serving in the church, but the way you're serving outside the church, the way you're living your life is an offering. A, a, it's an offering of praise to God that God's name is being magnified. And others are seeing that. So it means to honor God's name by offering the best in all you do. What does God want from me? Off, honor God's name by offering your best in all you do. So let me share this with you before I pray. I don't want to embarrass him. But I want to share a story with you about Joseph Griffith back there. Joe, I'm picking on you, okay, buddy? So talk with me later if this is not okay. Sorry to permission. This week, I went to, Dan and I went to make a hospital visit together at the hospital, Wabash Hospital. And Joe works over there, and he's told me before about his job and how he likes working there. And, said stop by sometime so I told Deanna hey before we leave let's go in and see if we can find Joseph and say hi to him and he was in there cleaning cleaning up in the kitchen or the tables and so forth working and he turned around smiled real big said, hey pastor Steve how are you today and just welcomed me and joyfully made me feel good Is it, isn't it good I want to be that kind of person that when you run into him you, you, you walk away thinking man I sure am glad I ran into him today that's how I felt running into Joe and and Joseph, he talked for a minute. He said, he said, Pat, and all these people were kind of watching, you know. He said, Pastor Steve, can I pray for you? All these people sitting there eating lunch. Can I pray for you? And I said, well, sh well sure you can, Joe. Just go right ahead. He said, okay. He just bowed his head, and we bowed our heads. And he began to pray. 
the sweetest prayer for my wife and I. And he mentioned Jesus' name several times. And he prayed in Jesus' name. Amen for all to hear it. I I hear people talk about God a lot of times and I'm waiting for it. Are they going to say anything about Jesus? Because what God are we talking about here? So I appreciated that. If Joe had went back to work right after that, and uh, he just said, well, I'm not going to clean that table over there. I can do it themselves. Then all of what he did previously about praying in Jesus' name in front of all these people would have been in vain, right? But as I was walking out of the hospital, somebody that was in there, two, two people that were in there happened to walk out of the cafeteria at the same time, and they, walked, they were behind us in the parking lot, and one of them spoke up and said, hey, uh, that Joe, he's a... He, they, they work at the hospital. They said, yeah, I know his dad, Casey, too. They said, that Joe, he, he is, or not his dad, his brother, sorry. He said, um, he said, and his mom works over there. They said, uh, man, isn't he something? He, he said, that, that place in there is absolutely spotless all the time. I mean, he owns that place. And he just bragged on him. He said, how do you know him? I said, we go to church together. He's part of our church family. And it, got a, it was another opportunity to connect part of why Joe is the way he is because, again, he has a relationship with the Lord through Jesus. So I believe that's an example of honoring God's best in all you do. You may not like where you're working at right now or your situation you know what the Israelites did not like their circumstances in Malachi's day but it was no excuse for second best offerings you may not like how your marriage is right now it may stink or your work situation or or the class you're taking at school or your car's not running right, or the kids are really having these issues. All this stuff may really stink for you right now, but you have no right to look at your circumstances and then therefore respond by saying, I'll just offer God some stinky sacrifices. He deserves more than that. He deserves everything. He deserves your best. So brothers and sisters, may we endeavor to honor God by giving our best. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that what you say to us, like you said through Malachi in his day, is in the context of a God that's continuing to love his people. We thank you, God, that in your divine plan, that those you call your people are all those who repent and trust in Jesus and are therefore called by your name. I ask, Lord, as we consider the weightiness of what that means, that it would penetrate down into the regions of our hearts, the wonder, the weightiness of what it means to be called by your name, adopted into your family, so that we would honor your name in all we do. So, Lord, we pause for a moment before we take part in the Lord's Supper. And we confess that we often dishonor your name. Even as those who don't want to and are not doing it habitually, we still do at times dishonor your name by what we offer you please forgive us thank you for forgiving us that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and oh God I pray for the one that's habitually and continually right now and how they're living They are dishonoring your name. 
God, I pray that you would grant them repentance. Show them that they're under a curse. And show them how much you love them this morning by the fact that they're here hearing this word preached. We ask it in Jesus' name.